Hey, it's Larry Goldings here, and you're watching Time to Connect. Hey, Larry Goldings, thank you so much for taking the time to connect. I appreciate it. My pleasure, John. It's great to meet you. Great to do this. Yeah, it's an honor, man. It really is. Uh, you are a West Coast guy now, is that right? Yeah, it's been actually... 20 years 21 years really that long uh yeah. you were born in boston right a suburb of boston newton mm -hmm. okay and lived in i'm sure for some time in new york is that right yeah i went to new york for college went to the new school uh the uh first graduating class i was in of the of the then the brand new jazz college there started by a great alto saxophonist named Arnie Lawrence, who's not, no longer with us, and uh, stayed uh, for 16 years. Yeah. I mean, not at the new school, but stayed, right. stayed yeah. in New York until 2001. Yeah. And and just curious why, why you decided West Coast rather than New York? I would say the biggest impetus was the fact that uh, my wife and I had had our first child and neither, and she's a West Coaster originally, and neither of us had family in New York. Um, and her parents are down here. They're in Orange County, which is about an hour from uh, where we are in Sherman Oaks. Um, and they, they're still around, but especially then they were really, really helpful with with Anna, our, our, our daughter. And, you know, I was doing a lot of traveling and it just seemed, I was sort of ready for a change. Mm -hmm. I, I was sort of up for it. I had thought maybe there were, I mean, I knew there was music here. I, I also knew that there was the possibility of film and television, right. music writing, um, which has happened to a certain extent and is still something that I'm interested in. Um, but it really didn't become the focus of, uh, I sort of continued doing what I had been doing, although, um, LA did provide some unique, still does, uh, relationships with producers and contractors and, and for people in the film and TV world. Um, uh, but it's still, I'm still, tr you know, travel quite a bit and it's, it, it is quite a nice place to come, to come back to and yeah. to, we raised our children here and. My wife's been a lot happier here, and and it's been great to have family here as well. Yeah. Right on. Are, are your you you have two kids? Is that right? Yeah. Are they They're, musicians? They are. I mean, neither of them are really pursuing it uh, professionally yet, but um, it doesn't. It definitely seems like a possibility. Mm -hmm. One one is Anna singing and playing guitar and writing songs, and Ben is playing drums and playing guitar and writing. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens there. Actually, the pandemic really did reignite for both of us, both of them their uh, interest in music. Yeah. So that was maybe the <laughs> one of the few positive things that came out of it. Yeah. Well, well, there there were some positive things. It was tough. How, how did you deal in general with the pandemic? It was difficult for yeah. me. Um, you know, I mean, I've gone through periods where I'm not traveling, and you know, and but at least in normal times, I, I can play locally and sort of, you know, stay creative with live music, live performance locally. And that wasn't even a possibility, as you know. So I was kind of going crazy. Yeah. Um, I did I did acquire some new skills in my studio and did a whole bunch of educational things from here, started a Patreon uh, during that time. And that's still going. And that's I'm glad that I've done that, but, um, you know, it was a challenge in so many ways, you know, um, yeah. I think my wife was used to me being, <laughs> being away four to six months out of the year. Yes. And I was, I was used to that kind of life and it was really hard and not to mention just the, the anxiety of, of the pandemic and right. not the not knowing of, I started, I started hanging I started going through pictures and putting up pictures in here of all the people I've been so uh, lucky to play with thinking, maybe that's it. Maybe we're not going to be able to do this anymore, you know? Yeah. But here we are. Um, I don't know if we're on the other side of it, but we're certainly in a better place. Yeah. 
just came back from Europe where it, it feels like it had never even happened, you know, and, um, and actually it felt really normal because my wife and I got, we hadn't gotten it until a month ago, uh, COVID and it was actually pretty bad, but we got over it and we felt like pretty free that we, mm -hmm. you know, travel without worrying too much. Um, so there was kind of a great experience we just had overseas because we, we felt we had the, the superpower antibodies, you know, um, but it's still, it, there's still a cloud of, yeah, you know, not knowing. You know, yeah. it's absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But, but again, there were some positive things that came out of it. Um, uh, and and I've talked a little bit about that to some of my guests. I mean, for one thing, this Zoom thing, uh, we all kind of got comfortable with this, and uh, it, it we could we could do videos from home in a way. I did some live streams from from home and got some really cool people to play and. You know, uh, it did. It it wasn't uh, exactly uh, the world we had before, but I think I think there were some good things about it, and maybe we now appreciate being able to play live and being able to connect with people live in a way we didn't before. For sure, yeah. that's 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 definitely true. Um, you can't. Um, I mean, the live streams that I did and and the Instagramming and so forth, um, I've been told were really helpful for for others. And that's, that's amazing, but doing an actual live stream and then it's over and then yeah. I'm sitting here <laughs> Yeah, was one of the more depressing uh, yeah. ways of, of performing, you know, because it lacks all of the things that, that make, um, playing for people so unique, um, yeah. Yeah. just can't exist without, without sharing a space with the people. Yeah. You know? yeah. Absolutely. Um, so it did it did did make me reappreciate that um and it did also force me to it almost my little studio here turned into what my what i had as a kid in a way uh, uh we had a house where we had a basement and the basement was really my 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 music room and i started pulling out lots of stuff that was in storage and kind of getting back into my synths and my little home organ and and mm -hmm. um all sorts of stuff, which really, um, uh, it, it made me realize how much that had been a big part of what I do, you know, this sort of tinkering with things and being, uh, or, or the, um, taking on the challenge of, of, uh, of just being a solo artist and trying to work with, um, uh, just being, being completely um self-contained mm -hmm. and i think i think i started playing organ for instance because i was my own bass player you know at home when i was in, had that basement set up you know and i was really trying to be sort of a somewhat of a one-man band and um i'm sort of back to that those kinds of setups in here which is really fun and in fact i now i think it's a it's a it's an idea for a, for a sort of a solo yeah um, concept you know um and i'm gonna do some gigs in europe in, in october where i've just told venues i don't even care if you don't have a piano just whatever you can whatever you can put together for me i'll get there early and i'll figure out what what a good set might be with, with these particular instruments yeah. um oh, cool. like a, i mean i asked for a controller keyboard at least so i can get sounds right. from my laptop but i sort of love that challenge i love the I love when limitations make you dig for the music that's inside of you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, Larry, there's so much I could ask you about. Um, I want to respect your time, but a uh, couple of things for sure. Definitely want to uh, ask you about some of the people you played with. I mean, the list is pretty incredible. Um, did you, you actually played with Sarah Vaughn? Okay, so that that I know appears in my bio somewhere or one of my bios. That really is a stretch. Um, okay. That was literally this very fleeting moment at this um, uh, at this ja international jazz party in in the Hague in, in Never Netherlands. So no, I did play a couple courses of the blues with her, and that needs to be removed from my bio because that's really a stretch. Yeah. But. The first gig I had was with another great singer, and that was John Hendricks. Right. 
Um, that was like, that was when I was still in college and I met him because he came through the new school um, as a adjunct teacher, basically. And um, that was like my first professional gig with someone of that stature. It was mm -hmm. like 1988 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you've been with James Taylor for years and um, mm -hmm. I'll throw some other names out there. Jim Hall, one of my mm -hmm. musical heroes, Steve Gadd, Herbie Hancock, Nora Jones, Maceo Parker, Carla Blay, Pat Matheny, Jack DeJohnette, Schofield, mm -hmm. who I, I want to definitely ask you about what's going on with him now. Charlie Hayden, Jim Keltner, Tracy Chapman, Beck, Leon Russell, John Mayer. I mean, wow. Um, yeah, some of those people are people that I've um, recorded with, but not really had a long-standing relationship with. But uh, but most of them are people I've also been on the road with. Um, yep. With some yep. of the people like like Nora Jones, I'm on a few of her records and things like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of those people I, uh, you know, I mean the ones that 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 really that I've really had long-standing relationships with, Jim Hall, John Scofield, we still. We still find situations, uh, different projects where we're playing together. Um, Maceo, also, that was very early on. Um, through Maceo, I did a, a gig with James Brown, which was, was also worth mentioning. Wow. And one of the first things I did during the pandemic was take out a box of cassettes, because I knew I had this cassette tape of a rehearsal, two rehearsals that we did with him. And I found it and I started digitizing it. And it's just crazy. Uh, wow. it's, it, that was such a, an incredible, sort of sort of a stressful situation because it's all about watching him for cues and so forth. And I didn't know what to expect from his personality, but he was great. Um, and nobody ever said a thing about the little cassette recorder that was right on the Hammond. Um, that was that was through Mace. Um, By the James way, the Brown, first yeah. first album I bought as a kid was uh, James Brown Live at the Apollo Theater. I, I think I was in fourth grade. Wow. I think my parents were a little concerned about me. I was that was not pretty <laughs> typical of a little Midwestern white boy in, in you know 1964. But uh, yeah, yeah, James James Monster. That's so cool, man. Yeah, and then of course James Taylor. That's been since 2001. About. And that was through my relationship with a great producer who used to be a staff producer at Warner Brothers, Russ Teitelman, still active, still um, in New York. And he had produced some records. He had produced Gorilla and, and I believe another record back in the day, and then got called to do one called October Road. And there was one song on there and Russ called me and said, look, there's a song on there that's really got a lot of jazz chords and he's got his his guys. And um, but I, I'm trying to convince him to bring you in for that one song. And that's how I met James. Uh, actually, actually, that day I met James, Steve Gadd, John Cicerelli and his regular band at the time, Jimmy Johnson, maybe Michael Landau was there. So. Wow. And we had just moved to LA, I believe. And so I came back to New York to do that. And yeah, long story short, he decided to make some changes shortly after that. And I, I joined the band. So, And are you still playing with him occasionally? Yeah, we just got off the road and we just did a really cool thing where we, where he was a guest for three consecutive days on the Colbert show. And he yeah, was that's a right. in the band and he wanted to bring me along. And then, so we, we did that. And, uh, but that was sort of the end of our, our U S portion basically of this year, but I'm going to be with him in the UK in uh, October. Right on, right on. Well, um, I've got a couple of other specific questions about some of those folks. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to say to you in case this music thing doesn't work out for you, uh, I think you've got a career as a comedian. Um, you are one funny man. <laughs> these uh, these uh, Hans Groiner videos. <laughs> mm. Wow. Uh, anything you can say about that in terms of the genesis of that? And yeah, the genesis of that. My my friend Peter Bernstein reminds me, and I I'm surprised at this, but he says he remembers me doing a version, not of not with the character, but the idea of what if some new age piano player. Mm -hmm. Completely misunderstood monk. 
yeah. uh, interpreted Monk and mm -hmm. removed, removed all the, you know, offensive notes and rhythm. <laughs> yeah. And so sort of like, what if George Winston, you know, not, no offense to George Winston, actually, he, I, I, I had George Winston records and I actually think he's a great musician, but what if someone like him, some terrible tasteless version of him, um, you know, because, you know, uh, the joke is that people still, um, especially then, but still, you know, uh, who are a little bit too naive to understand, you know, what, what jazz is or, or whatever, um, you know, think that that kind of, you know, what he was doing was childish and was, mm -hmm. you know, sort of uh, the, so, you know, that, that would, obviously was the joke and then um but so he said that i was doing that as sort of like a party trick you know back in the day i also did the opposite which is what if monk played yesterday by the beatles or something like that gotcha yeah I, you know which is all more of an educational thing to show people what in a very oversimplified way what kinds of things monk would do you know, um, to reharmonize or to monkify, you know, a song. So I do the opposite of Hans too, with not just as me, um, which is not as entertaining, I guess. But do so you have videos then, out doing that. I do. Oh, I, I, I have to look for that. I didn't see yeah, that. You, okay. I think on YouTube there's one I, I put out, and I I've done some of that for my patrons, um, taking like Happy Birthday and and Yesterday. Um, and it's it's really fun because you have to really be creative and and you know what would monk have done maybe mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and then you throw in you know monkisms again it's a very oversimplified version and uh, nobody can really play like him obviously but uh so when myspace remember myspace oh yeah so myspace came along and i and i created a page and then i was like well but what if i did some kind of character that was this guy who who um felt that he needed to improve on monk by um i will and so i did it anonymously i came up with the, with the name hans groiner i googled it to see if it existed it didn't and um found some guy's shadowy picture and put him as hans groiner mm -hmm with a fake bio about him being from Brownow, birth where, where Hitler is also mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't trying to mock Austrians or Germans. Right, or right, like right, yeah. But it just seemed fitting. And um, and I did it. Nobody knew that it was me. I didn't really tell anybody. And there was no video clips. It was just 30-second audio clips of different Monk tunes and a bio explaining that I'm a scholar who who feels that Monk could have been better if he just, you know, didn't play these funny notes. And I just sat back and learned the power of the internet, first of all, because yeah. the thing just yeah. exploded. Um, and there was a lot of people who obviously got the joke, but then there was a lot of people who didn't. Oh, and they really? Just, they just sent in things like, who the hell do you think you are? <sighs> Uh, calling yourself, calling yourself a monk scholar. You have no idea what you're doing, and I couldn't God. believe it. I was like, "Wow!" Um, so then, uh, I really wanted my friend Adam Rogers to be Hans Groiner as a as a person on video because he can do an accent, a German accent that's fantastic. But somebody convinced me, "No, you have to do it." So I went to Target and I got this bl blonde wig. Yeah. My friend Liz Cole, who's the sister of a great, now a really up and coming, um, uh, I don't know what you'd call him. He's a composer, a drummer, Lewis Cole. You might have seen some of his music. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, she was coming out of film school and she was, I asked her, could you help me with this movie? So she filmed and edited that first Hans Groiner uh, movie. And it was crazy how, how that got around. And even then, people, there was many people who thought it wasn't a joke, even though I'm doing all this stupid humor. Um, but uh, I, I have a, I, I did, I acted in, in high school. I was really into it, and um, uh, so I don't know. It tapped into some some uh, interests that I sort of had, and people who know me know me as you know someone who's likes likes humor, and I love 
you know, it's like a poor man's Christopher Guest and yeah. Yeah. and uh, Borat and yes. all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I just went for it because I, I like the creative challenge. And um, yeah, there was a period there where I couldn't go to a jazz festival without people going, huh? Hans, you know? Yeah. So it was, it was, it's been fun. And I'm actually, when I do this thing in, in Europe that I was talking about, the solo thing, I think I, I told my booking agent to book it as Larry Golding's with special guest, Hans Kleiner. So <laughs> Hans is going to show up at the end. I guess I leave the stage, put the wig on, and do like the last 20 minutes as Hans. Because oh, I've done some live gigs with where I hire a trio, abuse them, you know, and... Um, it's really a total whole different it's one of the most challenging things i've ever done i mean if it's mm -hmm. like i mean i i could never really seriously get out there and and do stand up comedy i mean uh, um but it gives me a taste of of it and it really is a great creative challenge in terms of figuring out how to how to sustain something like that for i don't know half an hour or whatever it is um so it's that's really been fun. I and and I have to say, like, the pandemic too. Just because I did a lot of goofy things um, that I put out on video during that time, it just kind of let me fly my freak flag a little bit more. Because again, I just felt like, am I even going to be touring again? Uh, what are we doing here? What <laughs> is, yeah. is where's the world going? And it's just like, well go for it you know yeah. um so i'm into it um and um surprisingly um you know even monk people who you know uh, i i think even t.s monk his son mm -hmm. um made a comment at one point he thought it was funny you know i was afraid that i was going to offend some people i i didn't offend any of the people that i I wouldn't want to offend. It seems like the people who are offended just the people who don't have a sense of humor and don't yeah. get it. But um, even Germans and Austrians, Austrians uh, seem to like Hans. So I don't know. That's good, man. I think one of the things the internet has taught us is is incredible lack of critical thinking skills that so many people have. How <laughs> how they how people couldn't understand that that's a joke. I don't get. But but look, you also you have that that side splitting. CPAC uh, national anthem fail video. You oh. clearly love to have fun with language. I mean, some of your song titles, "Let's Get Lots," that's that's hilarious. Uh, Hi ho, Silverstein, Taco Bell's Cannon, Scary Poppins, album yeah. titles like "When When Larry Met Har Harry." Is is humor? I'm just curious if humor is something. Were you a class clown as a kid? Is it something that you've always kind of had as part Somewhere, of your, your yeah. Life? Yeah, somewhat. Uh, I grew up loving Woody Allen movies. Mm -hmm. um, someone, unfortunately, a little controversial now, but yeah, um, Steve Martin, mm -hmm. those are my early comedic influences. Um, Monty Python, British, all the British stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it. My father has quite a good sense of humor. Um, and um, in fact, his side of the family, um, and uh, Victor Borga is a good example of someone mm -hmm. that I thought I, I think is brilliant with, with fusing music intelligently with humor. Uh, same with Peter Hubach, Peter Schickley. I thought that stuff was hilarious. Um, so yes, I, I it's always been, I love players who have humor um, as part of their, whether it's sort of Sonny Rollins and the way that he, mm -hmm is so clever with quoting tunes and um and monk as serious as this music right. is also yeah. just got a lot of mm -hmm. playfulness and childlike yeah. and i i know so many great musicians who have great senses of humor i particularly like sort of dry you know british type of humor um yeah it's it's part of it's definitely a part of me yeah and, um I try not to mix the two, you know, and I try to separate church and state, you know. I did do one gig where it was Hans, where it was me opening for Hans, and that's tricky. I'm not sure if I, if I, I mean, I guess that's what I'm going to be doing in Europe, but it's, it's, um, that's a tricky thing because you don't want to rob 
what what the seriousness of what, um, sure. your need. Um, but um, I kind of can't help it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I have, be, I have to be me. I'm I'm curious about something, um, uh, and I have an idea about this, but I'm, I'm I just want to throw the question out there, and I'm, I don't know if it's a fair question or not, but you are sought out by so many um, great world-class musicians. And I'm curious if you have an idea of why. I mean, obviously the answer is you're really good. Okay, fine. But let's let's think of something maybe more qualitative. What is it about you that makes you so in demand with folks like like James and and oh well I, I, and... I don't really know, but I I, I do know that um there's certain things that I put um that I prioritize when I when I play with people, um, I mean, as a sideman, uh, you, one has to, I mean, you're supporting mm -hmm. somebody, you know, uh, in the case of James, who's a, kind of a, um, uh, James is a good example because like, um, well, he actually, one of the things that he specifically liked about me was, was that, um, well, first of all, he loves he, all all the musicians pretty much that he hires over the years have some kind of jazz, either are totally from the jazz world or are somewhat from the jazz world. Jazz musicians tend to be flexible. They they can pick up things quite easily. You don't you know, they they're um, they can learn things by ear really quickly. Um, and of course, his music has a flavor of jazz. There, there's there's obviously there's jazz in it's 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 a very kind of small percentage but it's in there and um so he likes people who understand how to do that as well how to inflect folk pop or whatever you want to call what he does mm -hmm. with with jazz without sounding like oh he's a jazz guy mm -hmm. playing on top of what you know because that's not really what works would mm -hmm. still have to play within the confines so one thing that i guess i've always like doing and i guess i'm good at is kind of knowing in in specific ways what those confines are you know like stylistically like mm -hmm. i i loved i mean i was listening to obviously so much jazz but i was also listening to people like and really tuning into people like james's musicians or on records or like paul simon's musicians mm -hmm. like richard t or billy preston the way that even though if unleashed in a in a more jazz context, they, they could improvise and mm -hmm. do a lot of put a lot of themselves in it. Um, um, they all they knew what they were serving, and that was like somebody else's music and a sort of a, a style that had some confines to it that you have to be careful and tasteful enough to to know how to work within so I, I that to me is a challenge mm -hmm. that is as interesting and fun as other challenges like mm -hmm. you know jazz improvisation it's just a different i it's i i like i like that um so you're and 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 overall the challenge is you're trying to make others sound better you know yeah. so um so i always liked that and i always appreciated that about great accompanists and stuff like that mm -hmm. that it's really or great arrangers um like what makes somebody's version of a song um better than some another person's version of the same song mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is actually something that uh, johnny mandel said at a um that somebody i wasn't there but but they went to this thing where johnny mandel said when he was a kid he was wondering why there would be two versions of a song on the radio and one version was just so much hipper, even though the, the singers were just as good. And he realized it's the arrangement, you know, it's the yeah. person who came up with the the chord changes and um, and the, the, the bed in which, you know, the singer is 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 um, is being supported by. Mm -hmm. So um, I think um that's probably one of the reasons why i got into the organ because you can be orchestral on the organ and mm -hmm. so those choices that you're free to make um can really lift 
you know the people that you're supporting so i don't know i try i i try to find and then meanwhile i try to find ways that i can that larry comes through you know mm -hmm. um and um basically i guess i learned pretty and and i kept on learning about it through playing with james i think i i got better at playing with james um when i really started to fully embrace embrace the idea of simplifying what you're doing in order to really support him so i think a lot of jazz musicians as great as some can be sometimes aren't the right call right uh for those kinds of gigs because jazz players tend to just really want to show what they know all the time mm -hmm. and um that isn't always appropriate for the context yeah. so maybe that's something that i do well i don't know um also um i play or i you know i play i'm comfortable on roads and piano and organ mm -hmm. and he knew me as a bass player as a left-hand bass player as well and that's i think was the reason why he thought of going out with just me uh as we did in this one-man band project mm -hmm. so i think you know he felt that was unique that i could be supportive um just as a single accompanist so um and i'm just a very eclectic in what i what i've listened to and what i continue to listen to so i feel like i'm pretty adaptable mm -hmm. to situations um and my challenge there is to still find a way to sort of to sort of bring myself into it um and but I, I i find that people call you back when they consciously or unconsciously think you know i you know i sounded good that you know the, those yeah. the, those people made me sound good and supported me and then therefore the whole thing was was lifted up and i think that's what people are looking for that's what i'm looking for when i hire players you know and and that reminds me a little bit of bill frizzell and and the way mm. people talk about him every time you bring him in on a project he's just going to lift things up well i have an idea and I'll, I'll run it by you just for what it's worth it's probably a little bit of armchair psychology and may not may not be really of much mm. worth but as i think about you and listen to your stuff it, it seems to me that and and thinking about the humor too it seems to me that um, you know, on one hand, you could you can make people, you know, just laugh out loud with some of your stuff. On the other hand, I've mentioned to you that you just kill me with your version of she of that Nick Lowe song, Shelly, my love on the music from the oh. front room. It just <laughs> ripped my heart out, man. So you 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 play with feeling. Got, well, that would be I the guess head would be... and the heart. You know, you you've, you've got yeah. the perfect or, or, you know, nearly perfect technical skills, but you also bring just a really strong feeling into what you do thank you and i guess that is hopefully another thing that that people um are looking for when when you know um and i'm not you know i kind of wish i had like the technical skills of some other players um when i uh because i don't i feel like well it's just as important, if not more important, to play with feeling and yeah. to um, and to communicate with your audience, not just your musicians, your fellow nerdy <laughs> musicians. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really has been an important lesson with in, in in the in all the playing I've done outside of the jazz world, um, whether it's Maceo, uh, where people are basically coming to really feel good and to move their bodies, yes. and dance. Um, James Taylor, where people are coming to hear those stories and to be embraced by his huge uh, heart, you know, um, that you you're not you're not just there to uh, satisfy the intellectual mm -hmm. needs of musicians, you know, uh, you're there because people have spent money to go out and forget about <laughs> their troubles for a couple yeah. of hours. Yeah, and you give them. Um, melody and emotion and humor or whatever it is um that's that's really what it's all about right on and i'll tell you for me right now it's the scary golding stuff that that last one when when you brought schofield in i i 
I can't stop listening to that record. It's just, it's so good, man. <laughs> so oh good. man, that was a just, that was really cool also because those guys, Ryan Lerman, who's really kind of the head of that um, whole concept, he's considerably younger than me. All those guys are considerably younger than me. And um, that was just like a dream for them. And just kind of to see them, um, you know, and, and it's always, I, I never get tired of, of I, I never take for granted uh, how lucky I am to play with people like Sco and on and Mono yeah. Neon. I mean, yeah, that was Ryan's idea, and and I had seen some of his videos, and I thought, really, we can get that guy, and um, and then to see, and then, and then Sco and and Mono Neon had never played, and it was oh. it was just beautiful. Oh, it was magical. Um, yeah, and that's nice. That's been a great project because it's kind of marries some of the the funk stuff that I've done over the years with, with either with Maceo or also with Sco and, and um, yeah, it's been really fun. Yeah. Been, yeah. I, I wish that record and the music from the front room record and several more of your things were on vinyl. I'm curious. They all, the scary, scary uh, Goldings are all on vinyl. Are they? Just I just can't to, find them. Maybe they've sold out on vinyl or something. If you go to scary pockets. Yep. Um, dot com maybe yeah you can definitely see where you can okay. order them. okay well, uh, music from the front room though you're right because actually it's, it's also a perfect length it's like 32 minutes or something so it would make a good vinyl it does kind of have this old record kind of sound it does we, okay. we did it jay bellarose's living room um with his girlfriend an amateur engineer placing microphones everything <laughs> bleeding into each other and just kind of like we did them all they all took place over different nights late nights with very relaxed atmosphere not with the thought of making a record so and on an upright piano which has a vibe as well mm -hmm. so yeah yeah thanks for saying that i i i, I do plan to put that out on vinyl actually. good good right. we're, we're in a strange time with respect to vinyl now you know it's made such a resurgence and you, you look at uh, and i'm glad it has by the way i'm not I'm not an audiophile who wants vinyl because I think it sounds better. It maybe it does. Maybe I like the you know that old scratchy thing. I don't know. But for me, it's more about being a participant in the music as opposed to I love the convenience of being able to push a button, you know, and get anything I want and stream. That's great. I wouldn't want that to go away. But I also really enjoy that lo almost lost opportunity to sit down and put the record on the turntable and and have to turn it over and have to be present for it and almost be a participant and and for, i think that's one of the reasons that it's it's had the resurgence i think people long for that kind of thing today um but yeah man i i hope you will put that out on on vinyl i think that would be a perfect perfect um yeah i still play my records i this house we moved into seven years ago ha had has this um uh, this piece of furniture that has like seven, eight big, the drawers must have been made for records. So I was able to put all my records in there and um, I'm definitely listening to vinyl. Um, it's, it's, it's funny to think that there's a whole generation or two that, that didn't grow up with, with, yeah. with any with that experience yeah. uh, or the experience of, of waiting for a record, a physical record to come out. And I, me I remember so vividly dragging my mom to take me to the mall to get the new Steely Dan record, you know, because, and you hadn't heard it, you knew nothing right. about it. That's right. And it was like an event, yes. you know. Yes. And I now know. people just, people just feel that they have ownership over everything that yeah. they're streaming. And it's not an event. And, um, there's nothing physical about it. There's no liner notes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a lost thing. I mean, iTunes, they should at least figure that out so that every record that's that's digitized has a PDF, every anything that you would read, you know, yes. on a record. Yeah. Yeah. Including everything. Right. The names of the musicians, the names of the arrangers, the names of the composers, the names of the recording engineer. Uh, those are all uh, people's careers right there. You know, yes. it's like yeah. they're just there's like people just assume that the artist does everything, you right. know. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember it was over over 50 years ago. It had to be 1970, 71. I remember getting my mom to drive me to the store to buy the Sweet Baby James record. Couldn't wait to get it home, tear off the shrink wrap, put it on the turntable, and just sit and consume every word and, and picture. And it's a lost thing. Well, look, I can't believe how quickly time's gone by here. Uh, and and I, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I've got a couple of Maybe I can just get some, do some rapid fire questions and just get you quick, quick answers to some things. Um, who's someone you've played with an amazing list of people. Who's someone you've never played with that you would like to play with? Well, actually, even though I, I've known Bill Frizzell, who you mentioned over the, um, we really haven't done much playing at all. Maybe, I mean, we were on a record that we didn't, we weren't even in the same room at the, you know, it was the same at the same time he is one of my favorite favorite musicians i used to go to the vanguard and see that trio yeah. with joe lovano and paul motion as, right. as often as possible so bill would be somebody um um let's let's think um i haven't played with um i mean i never get to play with roy haynes um lucky to play with some unbelievable drummers um and he's someone i never know never did um sonny rollins as well <laughs> still with us so i think he's retired yeah um, never got to play with him um um let's see uh i did get to play with with charlie hayden which was a real dream come true i did get yeah. to play with Paul motion um wow. And record with him. Um, I, there are and there are definitely there's contemporaries uh, out there that I'm really interested in playing with. I just not they're not coming to mind right now. But um, plenty of people. I'm always fascinated by by there's so many young people that are I, cropping up that I, are doing amazing things. I'd like to do something with Jacob Collier. We've we know each other pretty well and we've hung out, but. Um, he's someone who I'm really interested to see where it all goes for him, you know, because yeah. I think someone like him comes around every hundred years, but it'd be really cool to do an actual project with him. Okay. Pick somebody, anybody from the past, you can bring him back to life and you, you can spend a, an hour sitting down, just the two of you playing anyone from bird to miles to Coltrane, who's someone that you would grab from the past to play with? I don't know, I just like to be around Duke Ellington. Yeah. You know, and spend a, spend the day with him. <laughs> Great answer. Um, um, I don't know, aside from that, to play with, I mean, um, I don't know, it's just the list is, is so long. Mm -hmm. I guess Miles, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I all, you know, through Schofield, that's my sort of connection to Miles, but um that would have been something else although i'm afraid of what of the, of maybe he would fire me or something yeah. say something that would just ruin my my self-confidence yeah he, he could certainly do that well short answer just let me throw some names and ideas out there and just see what you say uh bob dylan what are your thoughts about what do you think about when you think about bob i uh, just pure pure purity purity and poetry and i love People, people, when people say, oh, I hate, he can't sing, I just don't agree. I mean, right. yeah, he doesn't sound like himself now, but um, I love uh, Bob Dylan's classic voice, and those records are very important yep. to me. Amen. What pisses you off? What pisses me off just in general? Yeah. Um, I guess um, 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 pisses me off just blatant uh cruelty and blatant uh, racism and things like that and also people who are completely self-absorbed um i can recognize self-absorption because i possess some of it but um uh just people who are completely unaware mm -hmm. of, uh, of how uh, how uh, absorbed they are with, with, them, with their own thoughts. And... Yeah, I'm with you there. And and do you have 
do you have any kind of practices, Larry, to to deal with the slings and arrows of life? Do you meditate? Is it is it music, or do you have anything like meditation or or prayer or anything that you use when when things are kind of tough for you to get back to your center? You know, I'm 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 starting to uh, I'm starting sort of a breathing practice. You know. Um, I'm finding a lot of benefits to it, and I guess that's a form of meditation. Yeah, and and it it reduces my anxiety. I think it's also lowering my blood pressure, which I need to do. And but um, and then more recently swimming to a certain extent. But I, I kind of don't. I kind of don't. I probably I, I I often think I've I've been experimenting with uh, different kinds of meditation. I learned how to transcendental. I. I Med transcendentally meditate um which is something i did really like for a four months i did it and it had really tremendous benefits and then i just fell off the the wagon so i'm not as uh i'd like uh, you know i'm trying to be more disciplined with some things like that because i feel like now more than ever i need something like that but Amen. not really I, I would say it, it is if anything it's going to the piano mm -hmm. and just finding something that yes you know that it, that it inspires me and i'm sure that has some of the same benefits of meditation in the sense that you lose yourself you lose that ego and you just become yeah. absorbed in what you're doing um uh, okay man two more questions um we've uh you and i have both lost people we've we've experienced uh uh, the inevitability of getting a little older and death. And uh, I, I know recently I saw your your tribute to Francesco, um, mm. and it's something that, that we all deal with. I, I'm just curious, do you have any ideas, philosophies, beliefs, theories about death? What what happens when we die? Um, I don't believe in a heaven uh, or anything like that, um, but I... I have felt the, the spirits of, of people, you know, and I think that we are, we are out there, you know, when, when, when we die. Um, I, I had a very interesting experience after my father's mother died that she, you know, I was just waking up and she was just there sitting on my bed, you know, smiling, just being herself. And I just felt like she was there. So, um, um, I think it's 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 definitely over <laughs> for us. I don't I don't I don't really believe in reincarnation, but I do believe that spirits and the things that be and because of the things that we've left, um, uh, and and if we've basically lived a you know pretty good life. I've been listening to Ricky Gervais talk about a lot of these issues um, on his podcast with Sam Harris, which I yeah, recommend. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and um, I, I agree with all he has to say about that stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, but uh, I'm not a religious person. I, I think I'm an atheist, but um, I think we're still out there. You know, yeah. cool. Um, yeah. Have you seen Gervais's Afterlife series? I have. Yeah, that's great. Well, okay. I love it. Does Last that. question, Larry. When you are dead and gone, what do you hope people say about you? I guess, um, you know, that I, that that uh, that I made them feel good. That I that I that I brought something positive to their lives, and uh, maybe I made them laugh, um, and that I didn't hurt them in any way. Well, I think you've uh, you definitely have accomplished that already. Uh, you you have made the world a better place by who you are, with your humor, your incredible music, and your spirit. And I appreciate that. And I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk with me. And uh, I wish you all the best. I'm I'm hoping that I'll be able to get out to see. We didn't talk about your trio. We didn't talk about so many things that we could have talked about. But uh, um, I'm going to look for any opportunity to get out and see. I hope I can. Great. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Take care. You too.